Right now, it's my pleasure to open this award here officially. Um, I have, oh, you probably have already kind of spotted that there is a small glitch right now. Actually, uh, our main act, our winner this year, Tom Baden, is not here in person. Probably he can hear us, but maybe not see us right now. We'll have a connection via Skype to him. So in any case, even though he's not here in person, we'll see him, we'll hear him, and uh, we'll also listen to what he has to say about his research. So in, in that case, you know, everything is covered. I'm very glad about this. Um, yeah, um, so nevertheless that Tom couldn't be here, we still want to honor tonight his outstanding scientific work, and especially since his parents are here and also his mate or girlfriend will be here, um, Lucia Petio Gudino, and she will be here on behalf of Tom accepting his award. It's a great pleasure to introduce Tom Baden here as the year's winner of the Eppendorf Prize and to explain to you what we think is so fantastic about him. Actually, often one only finds out what's so fantastic about these people when one then meets them in person, but I'm very glad, glad that we made such a fantastic choice. Before I come to him specifically, I want to make a general point about the candidates that the committee has chosen, chosen over the last few years. In particular, it's interesting to look at their fields. For example, um, a couple of years we, ago, we chose Ben Lehner from Barcelona, who had an original and interesting and novel approach to understanding evolution. We had Liz, Liz Murchison here, who worked on transmissible cancer, something that almost nobody knew about. Um, Madeleine Lancaster, um, she was the first one to be able to grow human brain organoids in culture. These are all highly innovative and cutting edge topics. But the interesting thing is, the committee did not choose the fields. It's hard to see the fields often from the, from the applications. We chose the people. And the reason I'm mentioning that is because it illustrates that the best of the young people all work on really frontline, cutting edge, original topics. And I think that's very significant. And uh, Tom, you tonight are not an exception. I'm looking up there because I saw him on the screen up there. I don't know where you see us, Tom, but um, Clearly, he's not an exception, and I'll, you'll see why. There's also another point I want uh, to note about him that you will recognize as I go along. Tom did everything in the way that career mentors tell young people not to do things. For instance, he stayed on where he already was for his PhD, he stayed on as a postdoc. One of the postdoctoral projects he took on, he sort of took on a pre-described uh, 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 project by the supervisor rather than, as we tell young people, come with your own ideas, have your own ideas, make up your own projects. So it all sounded wrong. Um, but what it shows to me is that good people will make their own way in their own terms. They don't need the career advice. And in fact, they ignore the routine career advice that's so readily dispensed in every graduate program and in every workshop you go to. So that kind of advice may prevent the mediocre people from sinking to the bottom, but it's clearly not needed by the people who end up at the top. They have to rely on their own independent thinking and their, their, their independent path. And um, it's exactly the kind of independence that Tom's TV has shown. So to prepare for this interview, Laura Macheski and I had a delightful, long, long Skype. We thought we talked to him for 15 minutes. It was just so delightful. We talked to him for a really long time. And so much of what I'll be reporting now is, is, is what came out of the conversations from this with this Skype call. So we asked him about his career and how he made his decisions. And um, those of you who select graduate students or postdocs and read CVs often read this line, I knew from when I was very little that I was interested in science. So Tom said something similar, but there was a profound difference. One word. He said, I always knew I would be a scientist. Not even I always knew I wanted to be a scientist. I knew I would be a scientist. That's an amazing statement for, you know, about himself as a small child. And so there was just no question about it. And as we can see, that's what he did. He got there on a perhaps slightly unusual path. Uh, Thomas is German, and so German young men have to do military service after school, or they can decide to do uh, an alternative social service, which is what he did. 
And he ended up um, doing that uh, service in a research hospital in the Department of Neuropathology in Bonn. He was given a menial task doing PCRs. Those of you who are scientists knows that that's the last thing you want to do if you're interested in science. And indeed, uh, he concluded from this experience, where he of course saw the other science that was going on, science is great, but PCR is not what I want to do. He had set his aim slightly higher. He wanted to better understand computation in the brain. Tall order. And coming from some people, this would sound slightly megalomaniac. Also this first thing, this child thing, I am going to be a scientist. But Tom is actually amazingly modest. In our conversation, he attributed all his successes to luck or simply to being in the right place in the right time or um, credits his success to his interests happening to, con uh, to coincide with the advent of new imaging techniques and to input from others. He kept saying he was lucky to ride the wave. But we know that riding the wave, actually most people go under when they try and ride a wave. He stayed on top and he made it. I think Tom's modesty is a wonderful character. Um, and we could just use more uh, people like that. But even if Tom was lucky, let's assume he was, that was of course not purely by chance. Um, because A, luck favors the prepared mind, and we heard he was prepared, he knew what he wanted, and so when luck came his way, uh, he, he recognized it. And it also helps to put yourself in a situation where luck has a chance of striking. Um, so you choose your environment, not in the way that career uh, advisors tell us, but Tom seems to have had a knack for finding the right environment to foster his innate talents and his own excellence. He started his scientific career as an undergraduate in Cambridge, where he worked on Drosophila, on fly visual neurons. Um, and he was amazed to see that one could have a live fly in front of his eyes, in which he could, through intelligent uh, imaging mechanisms, watch what the neurons were doing. And when he waved his hand in front of the fly's eyes, he would see the neuron signaling. That got him ho hooked on molecular and cellular um, neurobiology. That was as an undergrad. He then uh, continued with neuroscience um, for his PhD, working now on crickets and on auditory, uh, so, so hearing and uh, auditory processing. Um, and one point, I just want to mention one brief point that he uh, brought up about his uh, PhD. And that was that he enjoyed it because it was a really small lab. It was a small group of dedicated people. So take note. Institute directors here, funders. I thought that was an interesting and very important point. Small labs are, if they're good, really productive. So then he did this thing where for his postdoc, um, rather than making a big intellectual and a big geographical leap as uh, advisors tell we must do, um, he actually just went down the road uh, to the LMB in Cambridge uh, where he switched to working in zebrafish with Leon Lagnado um, still using in vivo imaging or increasingly advanced in, uh, in vivo imaging, um, electrophysiology, and now um, genetics. So he didn't uh, follow the dogma there. And when I asked him how he made that decision, it got even worse. Um, so I said, how did you decide? And he said, honestly, very random. Um, he had, in fact, previously submitted a grant for an independent project. So he did have these ideas of doing independent. Um, but he told us it didn't get funded. And when he told us that, he said it really surprised. He said, it didn't get funded. So um, I think he hadn't seen the real world, which is also often good for young scientists. Just go for it. Um, but anyway, he needed a position fast. And so he took this uh, position at the LMB, of course, a fantastic environment. And of course, he again made the very best out of it. Um, he then uh, went uh, to do a second postdoc with Thomas Euler in Tübingen, one of the best uh, environments for neurobiology. It's a leading location. Um, and moved from fish to mouse this time. So he's really now got a wide range of experimental system under his belt. Um, but again, it was not in line with manuals on career advice for ambitious young scientists. And again, what's even worse, he went there for a project that had been preset by the PI. Um, which eventually ended up taking six years. However, uh, he had a lot of liberty to pursue his own projects. And so again, he found himself a, a, a fantastic environment. Um, and he turned, as in all of his previous steps, the situation to his benefit. 
So while he pursued this preset project, he also looked at other things, just playing around, starting on a few small side projects. And then he began to apply for his own funding and his own grants for these, and he succeeded. So maybe this preset project, which wasn't his own, even if it interested him, gave him the intellectual space to play around with his own ideas and that things that were really his own and to explore them without pressure. Having his own money also meant he was able to recruit people to work with him. And he has singled out one of his first graduate student, Katrin Franke, as one of the cases of luck that he's had. But he chose her and he gave her the project. How did he end up in Sussex? Guess what he said? Quite randomly. He wanted to go to Switzerland, where his partner, Lucia, um, was at the time. Uh, she now has a very prestigious position in London, where she's uh, set up her own lab. Um, but then instead found this position in Sussex that suited him very well. It was a good environment. It was a tenured position, so he's very sensible. Had good infrastructure in place and relevant expertise among the faculty there. So that's where he's now, uh, clearly in a happy environment, a happy person. What were his great discovery? Um, so Thomas explained to us that the retina is like a satellite disk that takes light from the outside environment or signals from the outside environment and turns it into signals that the uh, brain then uh, uses to build a picture um, of the reality out there. Um, this comprises a complex network of receptors, uh, cells and cones in the, in the eye that can distinguish color, light and dark, motion and pattern. Um, and since the 50s or even longer, neuroscientists have been developing tools that allow us to, uh, to figure out uh, how these uh, neurons function, how they perceive light, how they signal. And um, it's now possible to see these in real time. Central questions in this field uh, of vision uh, concern information processing. So how do all these complex uh, patterns of light with their rapid changes uh, get converted into the, simple, into the apparently simple binary language of neurons on off? Um, how, they, how are they transmitted and how are they stored? And then the handling of complexity. We have a finite number of neurons in our eye and a finite number, although a large number of neurons in our brain. How do they process the extremely complex spatial and temporal information? How do so relatively few cells um, and connections manage with this complexity? Thomas made major inroads into understanding both of these central problems. During his postdoc with Lagnado in Cambridge, he became interested in the bipolar cell, a cell that sits between the, recepting, the receiving uh, uh, layer of cells and the transmitting gang ganglion cell. Um, and they're needed to process uh, information images and uh, compress them to put them into the brain. So the bipolar cell is an information processor. It converts the signals it the eye receives into calcium spikes that are then relayed to the brain via another set of cells, the ganglion cells. He discovered that um, bipolar cells use a type of multiplexing to handle complex signals and transmit the out outputs that vary in intensity and frequency to communicate visual stimuli. This was particularly exciting because rather than just functioning as go-between, so a simple relay, bipolar cells tra transmit multiple types of signal which vary in intensity and gain adaptation via their multiple synaptic uh, 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 terminals. And I'm sure he'll be explaining this to us. This explained exactly, uh, helped to explain how a finite number of receptors can encode these uh, complex signals. So, Tom felt with this, he was really living his dream of solving how the brain computes information. And he sees his work as, on this as um, his best paper and was a bit puzzled that it wasn't cited as much as he had hoped or felt it deserved to be. But the finding he described in that paper was rediscovered two, two years later by a very much more famous scientist at the time um, who published it in, later, in Nature, uh, where it, of course, got a lot more attention. Now, any normal person would be furiously angry, but Tom, in his modesty and in his self-evasing and, and optimistic way, said it felt really good to know that I'd been right and that I'd been first, without any anger. <laughs> Tom also uh, discovered, and again he says he stumbled across, the finding that bipolar cells, uh, which were thought to, grad, uh, to, to, to respond to graded increase in signaling, in, um, could actually signal with an all or nothing, with a digital spike. 
Um, rather than ignore this, which was really not expected and shouldn't be like that, he found this interesting and pursued it to show um, that it occurs as a real in vivo response to visual stimuli. This was a textbook changing discovery, um, as these cells were simply not known to be able to do both this digital and analog signaling. So this is another huge quality of scientists, and that is to notice and to observe, and also notice and observe something that isn't supposed to be there in the, in the first place, and then pursue it. So we've already heard that Tom, um, in addition to doing his science, uh, does important and interesting stuff outside the science. And the most notable we've heard is this, um, is his engagement with enabling science in Africa. And he does that together with his partner, Lucia. Um, it started as a venture to teach neurobiology in Africa called Trend in Africa, uh, where they organized an international neuroscience PhD program for African PhD students um, that has so far graduated over 100 students. He hopes that these alumni will propagate this learning and that he has seeded an exciting future for neuroscience research in Africa. And along with this effort, he's developed protocols for these 3, 3D printers to make cheap lab, lab equipment for researchers in Africa, and he teaches them how to do it. Um, he considers this type of outreach as very important, but again, is very humble about his efforts, saying only that it helps him to get out a bit. He needs to get out a bit and feels that it's good for him because he feels that happy people work better. Well, it looks like he's proved the point. It's good to see such a happy and successful person. Choosing and interviewing him has made me happy, and I think we're all now happy to hear his scientific uh, presentation. OK. So I guess you can all hear me. Yeah, so I, I don't have picture now. I only see my own screen. I do hope that you can all hear me. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. I'm, I'm very humble. Thank you for the, for the multiple wonderful introductions, uh, of course, for the event itself. Um, and yes, please accept my apologies that I can't be here. It seems that I've been hit by some form of unidentified disease. Um, but maybe... Um, over the next 20 minutes or so, I'll be nonetheless be able to share some of uh, the work uh, well, that has led to this day, basically. Um, so, yeah, so the title of my talk is uh, What the Eye Tells the Brain and How It Got There. Um, and here's a nice picture that I always like to start with. Um, it's meant to emphasize the idea that different animals and therefore different eyes and sensory systems have very different requirements, right? So if we view the scene from the point of view of the owl and we imagine for a moment that there's no snow but there's grass, um, then we can immediately see the difficulty that the owl might have in spotting the mouse, right? So you, you, you would need very high spatial acuity. Um, probably color vision will be helpful, um, uh, etc. So the owl has large eyes to achieve this um, and uh, intricate retina network and, and brain for visual processing. Um, if we look at the same scene from the point of view of the mouse, the picture is very different. Here, basically, what needs to be achieved and what has evidently failed in this particular picture um, is that the owl uh, is uh, a dark shape on a bright background, which is above the horizon. So that's basically the task. It's a much simpler task. Um, and if you're the mouse, and if you want to be really good at this particular task, you may want to bias your visual system to be very good at this, perhaps at the expense of not being so good at other things. Um, and this makes a very nice introduction to the retina of the mouse. So um, as in all vertebrate eyes, the eye inverts the image. So what comes from below, uh, the visual horizon hits the upper half of the eye, the dorsal half, and vice versa for the half that comes below. And indeed, what people have shown um, many years before, actually, is that the bottom half of the eye, so the eye part that looks at the sky, is particularly sensitive to blue light, which makes sense um, because the sky is blue. And vice versa, the ground, uh, um, the, the half that um, comes from the ground is more sensitive to green. And in fact, what we've shown a, a, a few years ago is that on top of being blue sensitive down here, um, the eye is, in addition, particularly sensitive to dark contrast, so things like a bird on a bright uh, sky background. 
Um, but this is just at the level of the photoreceptors. And when we unfold the retina, and here you see a, a nice little cross section, you see that it comes, it is a layered structure. It has all, all, all manners of neurons. Um, here shown again in a schematized way. So what happens when light hits the retina is it hits these outer segments of the photoreceptors up here. Um, and these cells respond to light and change the activation. And then you've got a whole host of neurons down here which respond to that. Um, some of which, the bipolar cells, send that information further down here. And others, the horizontal cells, which I will not be talking about, they uh, provide lateral processing out in the outer plexum layer. So that's the first synaptic layer of the retina. Uh, and then later down here, you've got what's called the inner plexum layer. So this is the second synaptic layer of the retina. And then this, this, this is where, really where the computation happens. And most of what I'll be talking about happens here. Um, we have got the bipolar cells talking to these guys called the ganglion cells. Um, they form the connection to the brain. Um, and in this way, they form, they form a bottleneck, basically. So all of the information that hits, hits the eye has to, if it wants to reach the brain, has to go through, through the optic nerve. And as you can imagine, there's a, a very limited bandwidth down here, um, which means that a lot of information that gets initially picked up by the eye must be discarded um, in order for only the relevant information to be sent to the brain. Um, and this happens in part by the ganglion cells being particularly good at picking the right bits of information. And it happens because the bipolar cells and these other cells here, the amacrine cells, which I'll be talking about a little bit, um, pre-formatting the information that comes down from the photoreceptors. Um, so what I'd be hoping to do in this talk a little bit is to give an introduction of how, how the retina can do these things and how we can use uh, uh, high volume population imaging techniques uh, to, to understand really what information is being encoded by these different levels of neurons in the retina. So I'll be starting to talk about the retina ganglion cells. Again, these are the cells that send the output of the retina to the brain. So they're the only cells that have an axon that forms the optic nerve. Um, if you look at a ganglion cell from the top, so in plain view of the retina, um, it tends to look like this. It tends to have a cell body in the middle, or roughly in the middle, and then a tree of dendrites that surrounds it. And along these tree of dendrites, this is where it collects this information from the bipolar cells and also the amacrine cells. Um, and one fundamental property of the retina is that these cells, they, they don't come in isolation. They tend to come in groups or in mosaics. And these mosaics, they're very neat. Basically, if you take the mean distance between each of these ganglion cell cell bodies, you'll find that they're very constant. Um, so what happens is that one type of these ganglion cells uh, forms a regular mosaic all across the retina. Um, and then you might have a second, uh, uh, yeah, you might have a second type of ganglion cell or third or fourth and a fifth type, and they will also form these mosaics. And that means that if you now take an, a scan area of a certain size, that is at least as big as the biggest ganglion cell, and you record all of the cell bodies that are contained within, then what you can achieve is a complete sampling of all of the information that's being sent to the brain from a representative patch of retina. So this was our approach in this case. So what we did here is um, we did exactly this. We stained the cell bodies of these retinal ganglion cells with a calcium dye called Oregon Green Bapta 1. Um, and we did this in multiple tiles next to each other to achieve a large enough size. So this is about 500 um, microns across. Uh, no, sorry, um, it's 500 cell bodies in total. Well, it's actually oh, roughly 500 microns as well. Um, and uh, then we used a two-photon microscope to basically film the activity of these cells um, while they're responding to patent light. So here is one stimulus that we used a lot. Um, it's a very simple full-field stimulus. You've got a step of light. We're switching on the light here. Then we're switching off the light here again. Uh, we're switching it to half level and then we're flickering it at different frequencies and then different contrasts. But there's nothing magic about the stimuli other, this, other than that it's particularly good at making different types of ganglion cells respond in a different manner. So if I now start this video, and I hope this works, um, you should hopefully be seeing um, a little firework of basically 500 cell bodies responding to this stimulus, um, but not all cells doing the same thing at the same time. So the key thing to notice here is that most cells will do something at some point, but no cell will do something at all times, right? So what the ganglion cells are doing is they're effectively splitting this um, semi-complex stimulus into its individual constituents, right? Some cells will only respond when the light switch is on, some only when off, some only when it flickers at a certain frequency. And it is this type of information that the brain then um, uses to hopefully reconstruct the visual scene that was presented in the first place. So if we look at this in slightly more detail, 
Um, here is one of those um, partial scan fields, and here is the same uh, field highlighted with the, just a mask um, of regions of interest, um, which allows us to read out the uh, activity of each individual neuron. So, for example, if we look at the red cell here, um, this is not the activity trace that we can get in response to this cell, uh, to this stimulus. So what you see here is, for example, um, when we switch on the light, the cell doesn't care at all. But when you switch off the light, um, then you get a response. So it's what we call an off cell, a response to the offset of light. Um, and then it does respond to the flicker, um, just not so much to the high frequencies, and then it has a certain contrast response function. So we call this a partial fingerprint. This is just the sort of thing that this sort of cell does in, re in response to the stimulus. Uh, and because we wanted to expand the stimulus space a little bit, basically try not just this type of stimuli, but a few others, we also played moving bars. So these are bars that are just going across um, the retina in different directions at a constant speed. Um, and some cells respond very well to that, some cells do not respond so well, and in particular, some cells preferentially respond if the bar is moving in one direction over others. This is what we would call a direction-selective cell. Actually, this cell here is not direction-selective. You can see it responds in all directions the same, more or less, anyway. Um, but the, nonetheless, the stimulus helps us find those cells. Then we also got uh, receptive fields. This is a white noise technique. Basically, what you do is you flicker lots of, uh, you flicker a checkerboard and then reverse correlate the response. And then what you get is the area in space and in time where that cell responds best. Um, we also tested for chromatic preference. So we just played blue and green flashes, um, which are the two colors that the mouse can see. Um, so this is this one cell. So what we have here is what we then call is the full fingerprint of that one cell. But of course, now here we've got not just the one cell, we've got about 100 cells. And I've only highlighted a few here just so you can appreciate the diversity of the type of things that might happen. Right? So for example, if we look at this orange cell here, um, it's also an off cell. It responds just like this one um, in an off fashion. But then in all this, this flickering business here, it, it basically doesn't care. It responds a little bit here and then it gives up. Right? So it's clearly not the same type of computation that this cell is doing compared to this one. You can keep further, if we look at this brown cell here, there's no response at all to the stimulus, right? So it's, it's basically blocking the stimulus, but there still is an off response to the stimulus. So it's not a dead cell, it's just a highly selective cell which uh, responds to something that we haven't um, tested for in the stimulus. And you can keep going, for example, here, there's a direction selective cell. You can see it responds when the bar moves in this direction, but not in the other direction. Um, and so on. So you can keep playing this game. Um, uh, and uh, to cut a very long story short, so we put a lot of effort into this, and we, we did this um, not just for 100 cells, but for more than 10,000 cells, and we clustered them. Um, and this is basically the punchline of the story. Um, so we could cluster all of our cells that we had into 32 uh, pretty clear response groups, uh, which seem to align with at least 32 functional types of mouse RGCs. Um, and to give you a visual representation of the sort of computations that are being performed, um, this is now the same video that you see on the right that I showed you before, except now each cell is color coded according to the cluster that it fell into. And you can kind of see how the different colors sort of sequentially come on um, in an attempt to, to differentiate how, how different cells are responding to, to this very first stimulus that I showed you to begin with. Um, now, there's a lot of directions you can go from here, and, and we're pursuing that. But before, uh, you know, in, instead of talking about that more, um, I, I, I thought I'd rather talk about how do you even get to this place in the first place. So clearly what's happening here is the retina is taking a common stimulus and it's breaking it into a complex representation by 32 or more channels that are being sent to the brain. But um, there has to be quite a lot of computation uh, before this even is possible in the inner retina, um, uh, which presumably is implemented by the bipolar cells and the amacrine cells. Uh, so this is um, what I talk about here. So the bipolar cells, um, they're the neurons that sit just in front. So they're these guys that pick up the information from the photoreceptors, send it to the inner retina, and in the inner retina they talk to the amacrine cells, which are inhibitory neurons, and to the ganglion cells. Um, and one advantage that we have, especially for the mouse retina for the bipolar cells, is that they are anatomically um, completely uh, understood. Um, or I, 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 well, completely is always a difficult word, but um, as far as we know, we have all of the uh, bipolar cells at the electron microscopy level. So that's pretty good anatomical data. Um, there's 14 of them. It's, these, these are them. You can see that they come in short stubby ones and they come in long 
uh, longer ones. And the short ones uh, are what we call the off bipolar cells. Um, so these first four, they respond um, like we saw before in an off fashion through a step of light. The remaining are all on cells. Uh, on top of that, we knew um, that um, the ones that are closer to the middle tend to be more transient than the ones towards the outside. Um, we also knew that number one and number uh, nine uh, seem to be preferentially encoding chromatic stimuli. The other ones seem to be achromatic. But still, this this the, this, this um, breaking into off and on and fast and slow um, really doesn't explain why you need 14 types. You, it sounds like you could do that with six. So we really wanted to know, okay, so what, what do all these different bipolar cells do and how can they really drive apart the stimulus from a common photoreceptor input to, a, to something that ultimately gives rise to something like 32 or more ganglion cell outputs. Um, so we used the function, uh, a, a conceptually related to approach to what we did for the, um, for the ganglion cells. But here in this case, we used glutamate imaging. So glutamate is the uh, neurotransmitter used by bipolar cells. Um, uh, so the nice thing is then if you express this glue sniffer, um, which is a glutamate indicator, uh, all over the retina, and we look in the inner plexiform layer, which is where the bipolar cells send their synapses, we know that all of the signals that we're picking up have to come from bipolar cells because there's no other neuron that uses glutamate there. Um, so we use the viral injection type technique. Here you can see a quarter of the um, retina. This is a flat-mounted retina has been infected with, with a virus, which um, uh, uh, then it causes the expression of glue sniffer all over the, uh, the retina. And here's a cross section, and you can see here the red are uh, the blood vessels. These are the bounding blood vessels in the bottom of the retina. So these are um, basically the ganglion cells would be sitting here, and these are the last blood vessels. And then here, these upper blood vessels, they're the ones that, that form the upper boundary. So we know that between these blood vessels, all of the signals here must be bipolar cells. And then if you just uh, do a scan and we just take a stimulus and move it back and forth, uh, you can see here, this is now an ocean of synapses of these bipolar cells responding to a, um, a box of light uh, on a black background, just basically moving back and forth. And you can see this, you can still kind of see a box of light moving back and forth, but there's a lot more going on. There's a lot of complexity um, that we can't describe just by, by saying this was a box of light moving. Um, okay, so how do we um, begin to understand this sort of complex activity? Um, but what we did is we, um, we reduced the dimensionality a bit. So, for example, here we took a scan which um, sits roughly uh, in a particular uh, depth of the inner plexum layer and we played this white noise stimulus. So, again, this is a checker noise stimulus, um, which, uh, depending where in space your bipolar cell sits, it will respond or not respond to the stimulus. And what you can see in the little video, or hopefully you can see that, um, is that uh, at different times in the video, different parts of this image come on. Um, which effectively are multiple superimposed bipolar cell axon terminal systems. So you have to imagine there's multiple of these red cells which sit there um, at slightly different positions in space and therefore responding at different times um, because the stimulus will be positioned slightly differently over time. So using this kind of information, what we could do is we could place regions of interest uh, where we could be reasonably sure that these positions belong to a particular cell um, or particular terminal of a cell at any rate. And then we could read out the, in, uh, the activity at the single synapse level. So for example, if we look at this um, synapse number three down here, uh, and we play again the similar stimulus term to what we've shown before to the ganglion cells, um, but now with a modification, we've shown it as a little spot here and as a big spot. And uh, what you can see is that for the little spot, you get a certain response profile. So this is an onset, quite clearly a response to the onset of light. You get a certain decay, and you get a certain response here and here. And then if you play the same stimulus, just simply bigger, um, you see the response waveform changes a bit. For example, it doesn't respond very well to the step anymore, but it still responds to this flicker, right? So clearly by making the stimulus simply bigger, there's an effect on the response. Um, we found multiple units in this particular scan that were doing exactly this, and they're highlighted in red here. So for example, one, two, and three, they all do basically the same thing. Um, but then, for example, four, five, and six, even though they basically do the same thing as the red ones um, for the small spot, for the big spots, they don't do the same thing because they still do respond to this step. So the interpretation would here be then that here, these red guys, these are synapses that belong to one type of bipolar cell, and therefore they do one type of computation. And these green synapses belong to another type of bipolar cell, which sits in the same depth of the inner plexum layer, and therefore recording both of them at the same time. <clears throat> 
So again, this becomes quite complex. So here, again, you get something in the order of 100 regions of interest per scan. Uh, and we did this multiple time, again, going um, uh, something over 10,000 units now, and we've clustered them. Uh, but this time, the difference, um, uh, oh, the, the thing that we could use in aid of our clustering was the anatomy, the known anatomy of these bipolar cells. Um, so, for example, here are two examples of bipolar cells. Here, this is what you would call the type 2, the type 5 bipolar cell. And you can see they stratify in very different layers, right? So, depending where you take the recording from in, in this depth dimension, um, there's a certain probability associated with recording from each of these types. So, for example, when you're recording up here, there's basically a zero probability you're recording from the green guy, and vice versa, if you're recording down here, you, you're not going to be picking up this guy. So, here are the depth profiles of all the bipolar cells which means that for any one um, depth, for example, depth A here, we can make a probability distribution of which cell we're picking up. So we're probably picking up cell number one, possibly cell two, and there's basically no chance of picking up anyone else, right? So we can use that information to inform the clustering algorithm to make basically a better um, allocation of each response into a particular response cluster. Um, same thing for depth B, you just get a different distribution of cells. So we did this and this worked very nicely. Um, so it came up with this clustering. Um, so here are the 14 types. Um, here is the response to the small spot. Here's the response to the big spot. Here's also some other stimuli that we used. I won't be talking about those now. Um, okay, so we thought, okay, that's great. So now we've got a fingerprint of all these bipolar cells, but what, what have we really learned? Um, and to me, the striking thing was that if you look at the responses to the small spot, let me just, we just take the first five here. Um, and we just look across um, what these responses do. You know, if you try hard, you'll probably find some differences, but the, the differences are really quite unimpressive, right? Um, based on this sort of response difference, you really wouldn't judge that you need five types of cells to encode this information. Maybe one or two would do, right? Same for the ONS. They're basically all would be the same when you take the small spot, okay? But when you take the big spot, um, that makes a huge difference. Suddenly, this all falls apart, right? So for example, if you look at number eight and nine, they have basically the same step response here. Now, um, number eight continu continues having the step response, but number nine completely changes. And this is basically true across the entire range. The second you take a big spot, everything gets much more decorrelated and much more different from each other. Um, so let me just highlight that in a particular um, uh, for two, two examples. For example, here's a number six and number nine. So here's the small spot. Um, this is the response for the small spot for six and for nine. And if you superimpose them, they're basically identical. They have a correlation value of 0.9. And even if you look here at the finer details of this flicker, um, again, very closely correlated, correlation value 0.8. So they're F, as good as identical. Um, but then if you take the big spot, this completely changes. Um, now they look completely different when you superimpose them. And if you look at this flicker, they're basically uncorrelated. Like here we've got 0.2. So this means that there's something about switching on. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, the same happens for, for off pairs of cells. So for example, here we go from 0.7 to 0.1, so they actually go slightly anti-correlated. You can see there's a phase shift when you take the big spot. Um, so uh, this effect is um, uh, happens uh, to different degrees for all pairs of bipolar cells that we uh, that we looked at. Um, so they're always very correlated when they've got a small spot, and then they're much less correlated when you've got a big spot, and they actually get further anti-correlated if you look across polarity. So if you compare the ons with the offs, of course, they're going to be anti-correlated, but they go more anti-correlated when you use a big spot. So there's something um, happening, of course, uh, when you put the big spot that uh, makes these cells more different. And uh, the way to understand this is uh, it comes... Um, perhaps unsurprising for those in the field. So for many years, we've now known that these cells have a center surround organization. So this means that in the center, um, they're getting direct in input, probably from their dendrites. Um, and that drives them in, in, in the manner that we always think of them. So when I say an on bipolar cell, uh, we're talking about an on center bipolar cell. Um, but on top of that, we've got the surround input, which for the bipolar cells comes from the amacrine cells. So these are inhibitory neurons that talk to the bipolar cell, not at the dendrites, but at the axons. Um, and they can, um, well, they inhibit the bipolar cells, so they tend to go in the opposite direction. Um, and then uh, what seems to be the case is that by the addition of these amacrine cell inputs uh, is that we're generating all these effects, that we're decorrelating the retina. 
And I should point out that decorrelating the retina is a good thing because um, the last thing you want to do is uh, you want to have you don't want to have two neurons that do the same thing because that would be redundant, right? So that that would be a waste of a neuron. So you want them to do different things. Um, so uh, here's a little schematic to maybe highlight this a little bit more intuitively. So up here, we've got the bipolar cell dendrites, we've got the photoreceptors, and these are the bunch of photoreceptors that respond to the small spot just because they're in the right place. And then you get your center response being propagated through the bipolar cell. But then when you take an annulus, so basically that stimulates all of the photoreceptors that are not drawn here, um, they in turn will activate other bipolar cells which sit here, which will activate these amacrine cells, which will then feed onto these bipolar cells and thereby inhibit them. Um, and so what we actually observed is that if you take a small spot, again, you get a particular response waveform. If you take the opposite, so if you take the annulus, so this is now not the big spot, this is the big spot minus the small spot. What you can do then is you can actually flip these bipolar cells, right? So rather than turning, um, responding in an on fashion, in this case, this guy responds in an off fashion. And this is true for all of the bipolar cells. Um, so uh, evidently, there seems to be pretty dramatic investment from the amacrine cells uh, in being able to modulate the activity of these bipolar cells. So um, just as a little concluding um, gimmick, so we wanted to know um, at which spatial scale this effect is maximal, right? So, so we're thinking, okay, decorrelation of these signals is a good thing because you want to get different neurons to do different things, otherwise they're redundant. Um, so how big do you have to make the stimulus before this effect is maximal? So what we did is we calculated the correlation between all these responses um, with high correlation being well, the same, so bad, and low correlation being uh, different, so good, um, uh, for different stimulus sizes. And as it turns out, the, this effect peaks at about 300 microns. And the reason this is particularly nice is if you look at the size of a bipolar cell, they're about 40 or 50 microns. So clearly, if you hit, if you use a spot the size of a bipolar cell, this effect doesn't work at all. But um, at this size, this is actually the size of ganglion cells. So it seems that these bipolar cells uh, are tuned to best decorrelate the stimulus at a, at a spatial regime that is optimized to hit the ganglion cells, so the, the one, one neuron level further down. Uh, which effectively is the only size of stimulus that the brain can see because the bipolar cells don't go to the brain, it's just the ganglion cells that do. Um, so I think this is a very nice example of how, uh, how, how you can use a bunch of small neurons, which are the bipolar cells, to, uh, to compute something um, for, for the projections, for the, for the next layer of neurons, which they can then use to um, further decorrelate the signal and hopefully deliver the most efficient message to the brain. Um, of the visual stimulus that came in. So, uh, so this was the work that we've done um, in, in the lab um, while I was still in Tübingen. Um, and at some point I was wondering, okay, so what does this all mean? So here we've got the retina, right? And we can record, I didn't talk about this much, but um, we can also record from the photoreceptors in this way. Uh, we can record from the bipolar cells, we can record from the ganglion cells. Um, but effectively, what we've done is we've taken a big torch and we flick at the torch and then we've recorded all these responses from all these different layers uh, in the vain hope of hopefully trying to understand something about how the retina works. And of course, that can get us so far, but the problem is that the retina has not evolved to see flashing lights in the dark. Right? The retina has evolved to see, um, well, to decode nature, to tell animal what's going on in its environment. Right? So to what extent, for example, any one of these ganglion cells is particularly good at seeing a flapping wing of a bird or the tip of a grass or God knows what, what they're trying to encode. Um, this approach really doesn't get us very, very far. Um, on top of that, um, if we look across uh, animals, not just vertebrates, also invertebrates, every eye is extremely different. And the reason these eyes are different is because each eye has, to some extent, evolved to be particularly good at one thing and not so good at other things, right? So you, you need to adjust your sensory systems to be good at the things that make you survive and thrive in your environment. Uh, and as a result of that, not just the eyes are different, but the retinas of species are different, right? So here we've got the mouse, or in this case, this is actually a rat, but there's not so much difference between mouse and rat. And you see there's a certain structure associated with this retina, right? So you've got quite a lot of cell bodies up here. These are the rod cell bodies, um, which pick up low light. So it's pretty good seeing at low light levels. Um, but then if you look at other animals, for example, the zebrafish, there's there are hardly any rods. Um, there are many more cones. Um, you can see that the retina is much thicker in total. You can see the cell bodies are smaller, meaning it's trying to squeeze more cells into the same space. 
possibly trying to compete more com uh, more complex things. If you look for the birds, um, it gets much more complex. You see, you can see really strong layering here in this in a plexiform layout. This is this is basically where the retina computes most of the information. Um, on the low end, you've got this guy here, Nectorus. You can see the huge cell bodies, right? So it's clearly not investing as much neuronal real, real estate into into the computation, more into reliability. Um, the human is on the other end here. Um, so uh, just by recording from the mouse, which we've done now for many years, um, we might get the false impression that we're starting to be at the point where we understand how retinas work or how, how vision works. But uh, I, would, I would strongly advise caution, right? Because just because we've understood what some cells are doing in response to some set of stimuli, we really haven't gotten very far at all in our understanding of how vision works or what it's even, uh, yeah, what part of vision is being done in periphery, what part of vision is done in, in, in central circuits. So in my new lab now, what we're doing is we're looking at zebrafish in particular, but we're also expanding to birds. And hopefully at some point I'll be able to show you, um, well, new and interesting insights about those retinas. Um, yeah, so with this, um, I would like to close. Uh, again, I would thank you all very much for your attention and and everything. Um, the key people that were involved in this research are these guys here. So this is Katrin Franke, this is Philip Behrens. He was very much involved in the uh, uh, in the statistical analysis, so the, the computational modeling, modeling the clustering and all that. This is Thomas Euler, he's very involved in, in most projects. Uh, Katrin Franke has done the vast majority of recordings that I've shown you. Of course, the other people in the lab and collaborators, and also these are all the people from my new lab and collaborators. Yeah, so with this, uh, thank you very much.